let, first of all, I want to look at that title, our, our Dominion Mandate, all right? And, for, and, and think of the word mandate. Now, I know some of you are taking notes, and I want to make sure that you get uh, some of these things down. So now, uh, the word mandate I put there on purpose because the word mandate means an authoritative order or command. Now, this is an, this is a, an order from our commander-in-chief. And it's for the whole body of Christ. This is not a suggestion. It's not good advice. It's an order. When any time we get an order, we, can, we have two choices, right? We can choose to obey the order or choose to disobey the order. And God leaves that choice up to us. But what I'm saying is that what, I, what you're going to see about this is that it's, for those of us who are committed to the Lord, it's not a choice it's a mandate, and we must obey it. Now, the word dominion. The word dominion means control, it means rulership, it means authority, it means to subdue. And it, it relates to society. It relates to the society in which we live. Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done where? on earth, remember that, as it is in heaven. So as things operate in the kingdom of heaven, we should see that manifestation here on the earth in the society uh, in which we live. In other words, what, what dominion means is that we're the head and not the tail of, of our uh, society. We, we, it's, it's a rulership and we rule as kings. You know, it says in Revelation that God has made us kings and priests. And uh, so we have that responsibility. <clears throat> now, let me, let me say it this way. Dominion mandate is another word for the Great Commission. We're used to the word Great Commission, but when you, when you see this, you'll see that taking dominion is uh, the Great Commission. And I'm going to read a verse that everybody knows from Matthew 28, 19 and 20, where Jesus, here's what Jesus said to his disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Now, he said make disciples of what? Make disciples of all nations. Nations. That's, that's where people live together. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, geographical members of the United Nations. That doesn't necessarily mean that. It can be a people group within a nation. It can be a province, it can be a city, uh, it, it can be a region. But wherever people are living together in society, that's what uh, in the Greek pantata ethne means. Not, um, not, and it also means nations, like the nation of Canada. I mean, is it, would it, could it be possible that Canada would be a nation counted as a nation, a disciple of Jesus Christ? I think it can. And um, that's what we're... That's what we're um, that's what we're talking about. Jesus to always told us to preach the gospel of the kingdom, right? Okay. Now think of the word, think of the word kingdom. The word, it, it, it's two parts to the word kingdom, right? King and dumb. I don't mean dumb in that sense of the word. I'm just talking about king and dumb because dumb, D-O-M, is the first three letters of dominion, right? And so... And so the, in, in every situation of dominion, there is a king. And Jesus told us to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, what does it mean? It means healing the sick. It means casting out demons. It means saving souls. It means multiplying churches. And it means transforming our society. And so that's why I call this talk our dominion mandate. That's, that's the meaning of where I want to go. Now, let's go to the Word and explore this. And what I'm going to do, I'm trying to simplify it as much as I can. I want to give you four, four points to understand our dominion mandate. Point number one. Dominion theology begins on the first page of the Bible. I'll say these points twice, so those of you who are taking notes... Uh, can get them. And I encourage you on God TV and on the web also to uh, join in and write these points down. 
The first one is dominion theology begins on the first page of the Bible. You know, this, just saying that, there must be something significant about it. <laughs> and it begins with Adam and Eve. Now, God created the whole universe. I'm, I'm telling you, which, of course, what you already know. Um, every time I get reports, and you, I bet you you do too, like new discoveries come from the Hubble telescope and the newspaper. Is it, do you ever get any discoveries that make you think the universe is getting smaller than you think? No. Every new discovery, it's, it's, it's absolutely, un, we, our minds cannot comprehend the universe, and God created all that. He created all these millions of galaxies. And um, yet, right now, we're not going to focus on the universe, but we're going to focus on a little speck of the universe called uh, planet Earth. And, um, and so God created planet Earth for a special reason, different from all those other things you see in the, um, in, in the galaxies. And so what did he do? He went about, he created land, he created gravity, he created light and darkness, he created water, he created an atmosphere with oxygen in it, he created temperature and plants and animals, and we could go on and on. He created all these things, and the last thing he created were human beings, but that was, that was the first thing he created in his image. And what does it mean to be created in God's image? What's different for, uh, between human beings and all the rest of God's creation? Well, there are a whole lot of things. But for one thing, God created us in his image so that we could communicate with God. That's number one on the list. We can, we, we can communicate with God. Number two, because we can communicate with God, we, have, we can have a personal relationship with God. Isn't that awesome? I know you're just saying, well, what else is new? This is Toronto. I mean, <laughs> God is not father, he's daddy around here. And, uh, and you know about that personal relationship with God because uh, this is one of the best known centers in the whole Christendom for uh, br bringing people into that relationship as a, as a friend and as a son or daughter. And um, so, but, but you can't do that with a monkey. You can't do that with a, with a salmon. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's only human beings <laughs> that, that, can, that, can, uh, that can do that. All right, now, that leads me up to this other thing that makes us different. God created us as free moral agents. I want you to get those three words down if you're taking notes. Free, free moral agents. I'm going to bring this up again because it's, I'll tell you how important it is to be, a, it's how, not important, how necessary it is for us to be free moral agents because love cannot be forced. Love, you, you cannot make anybody love you. Because if you try that, and they say they do, it can't be really be love. Why? Because love has to come from the heart of the person. And so if it comes from the heart of the person, then there's a choice to love or not to love. And in, with all integrity, God had to create Adam and Eve as free moral agents if they were to love him, because that love had to come from them. He couldn't create somebody who he, has, who he was forced, who he was forcing to love him. Now, God had a plan for what Adam and Eve should do once they were created and placed here on the earth. And that's why I say this, come, this starts in the first page of the Bible. And I'm going to quote, actually, it's, it comes twice. It comes in Genesis 1.26, before he created Adam and Eve, and then it comes in 1.28, after he created Adam and Eve. And I'm going to choose the 28 after he created, but it's almost the same wording. Here it is in Genesis 1.28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, every living thing that moves on earth. He said, have dominion. Everybody say dominion. dominion. 
That's right there on the first page of the Bible. And so God told Adam and Eve that this is what they were for. They were to take dominion over the earth. Now, God, God created the earth, and he established a government for the earth. And who was to govern? Adam was to govern. That means, that's another word for taking dominion. Adam was to govern all this creation that God had made. Now, let me tell you one more thing about Adam. Adam is a Hebrew word. And it's not just, just, it is, but it's not just the first name of individuals. We probably have some people here or watching on God TV or watching on the web whose name is Adam, okay? And that's a good name. But the Hebrew name Adam, Adam means humankind. So that's very important. You understand what I mean? It means the, he, God created Adam, called him Adam, but that was the word for the whole human race. So what am I saying? The whole human race was represented in Adam, which means you were there. And so was I. You know what? Every one of us in this room has some of Adam's DNA. Now that we know more about genetics, we were, we were all there. So what God said to Adam, my point is, if he said it to Adam to take dominion, he's also saying it what? To us. Because we're his people, and, uh, and we, we were there. So this is what I mean by uh, the, the dominion mandate. But don't forget, Adam, I'll say this many times, Adam was a free moral agent. So he was created to take dominion, to run the government of the earth, but he had a choice, just like we do. He had, now get this one, Adam had authority to take dominion. He also had authority to give dominion away. That's the way he was created. Which brings us to point number two. Okay. Point number two, the enemy has attacked the dominion mandate since day one. I'll repeat it. The enemy has attacked the dominion mandate since day one. Now, you may not always have thought of it this way, but Satan entered the Garden of Eden for one main reason. And that was to usurp the dominion over the world that God had given to Adam. Sometimes we dilute that idea and we say that Satan entered the Garden of Eden to tempt Adam to sin. That's true, but that's only a small fraction of what Satan was really after. Satan was after the dominion that God had given to Adam. Now let me explain a little bit about Satan. <clears throat> which you know, but I'm just putting it together for you. <clears throat> now, Satan was created by God, and he was created as an angel of light. I mean, God created a lot of angels, and Satan, and uh, all angels aren't the same. There are some angels better than others. And God created Satan one of the best. He was one of the top angels. And... Um, he was an angel, because he was an angel of light, that's why he bears the name Lucifer as well. And so he was, he, I mean, talk about worship. He was one of the greatest worship leaders that heaven had. So he, God created Satan, and it was, Satan was good until Satan decided to go into rebellion. Bad decision. He gathered, he gathered some other angels and tried to overthrow God's government. <laughs> well, it didn't work. So as a result, God cast Satan and a bunch of other angels out of heaven. He got rid of them, as far as heaven is concerned. And some scholars think that maybe a third of all the angels uh, went out with Satan. Okay, let's analyze this a little more. Satan once when he was first created, he had power and authority. He was created a powerful being, and he had authority. When he was cast out, 
of heaven to the earth. He still had his power, because it's part of who he was, but he didn't have any more authority. Because, see, the only, way, the only source of his authority was God. So he had his power, but no authority. Let me just, you may not have heard that expression before, so let me just try to explain, illustrate what I mean. How can you have power and no authority? I'll, I'll give you just a, a home-type illustration. I live in Colorado Springs. Colorado, our, our, we live in a place called Black Forest. Our home is uh, 7,300 feet above sea level. And, uh, and in fact, we live in the woods. Fortunately, we live in the woods so far in the woods, my cell phone doesn't work at home. And that gives me a lot of peace and quiet. <laughs> and, um, um, but, uh, you know, we have, we have, for example, we have bears. And uh, I, I like, uh, that's a whole long story, but I like livestock. And Doris, my, my wife Doris and I um, like llamas because we served as missionaries in Bolivia, which is the home of the llama. And so we have llamas. Well, we had llamas. We had we had a bunch of them until a bear came and killed one. And then for some reason, a whole bunch of others died. The veterinarian couldn't figure out what they died of, but they, they, I think they needed inner healing. So <laughs> couldn't, they died of some, except one. One got left. His name is George. So we still have George. I fed him the day before he came. And, um, and anyway, uh, uh, we live in an environment like that, way out in the woods, see? So I have a gun. I mean, I have a 20-gauge shotgun, and I know how to use that shotgun. And I keep that shotgun loaded at all times. There's no use having a gun that's not loaded. I can tell you that right now. And um, I keep that gun, it's about six steps away from my bed. You know, and <laughs> I mean, Colorado's Wild West. We even have what's called a make my day law in the state of Colorado. If anybody comes into your house, forces the way into your house, you can kill them and you will not be taken to court. I mean, that's the law in the state of Colorado. So you better watch out. I got my gun and, um, <laughs> so, and, I, and I take that gun out in the woods where I am and I can, sh when, when I have that 20 gauge shotgun in my hand, I have a lot of power. And bang, I mean, I can, I, I, I can use that shotgun and um, all I want out in the woods. But if I take that same shotgun into the city of Colorado Springs, get it? I still have the power, right? But I can't shoot it because I don't have what? I don't have the authority. I cannot, sh I cannot use that power in the city of Colorado Springs. Only law enforcement officers can do something like that. So that's how you can have power and no authority, which, is, which was the condition of uh, Satan. Now, I'm spending quite a bit of time analyzing, uh, analyzing um, Satan here because this is, this, this is very important. To, uh, it's important, to, I'll bring it up again, but it's important to understand our enemy. And uh, when we, when, think of Satan. Since he had the power and no authority, what would he want, logically, more than anything else? Authority. He wanted authority to go with the power that he already had. And not only that, he wanted to get authority, and he wanted to maintain authority. Now, that's why Satan approached Adam and Eve. He approached Adam and Eve because he knew something. He knew that Adam had the authority to take dominion, and he also had the authority to give dominion away. Why? Because he was a free moral agent. And Satan knew this. So Adam could obey God, or... He could obey Satan. He had the choice right there. We read about it in the, in, in, the, in the Bible. And Adam made the worst possible choice. He gave his dominion to Satan. And that put him and us, don't forget, we were there. It put him and us under the dominion of Satan. From the, from the first page of the Bible. Now, we who live a couple thousand years after Christ, we 
we really have a difficult time understanding how miserable the world used to be before Jesus came. We can read about it in history books, and, and I try to do that. And, and um, life, life, was, was life on planet Earth was a miserable, miserable life. Wars were normal. They weren't just something that make headlines in the paper. Uh, that wars were normal. Well, I mean, even the Bible says it was springtime, the time the kings did what? They went to war. It was, just, it was just normal. And not only that, but war was extremely brutal. I mean, we hear brutal things today, but it, 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 and it was just part of the, the daily life of war. I just photocopied a, a, some verses from the Bible. Just to, you don't have to go any further than that to see how brutal war was. Doesn't even matter where it is. I'm just going to, let's see, well, I'll read three verses. I just took this from the Bible because it's, you find it there. You don't even notice it, where it is, <laughs> Jeremiah. But it says, listen, listen, the Chaldean army pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. When they'd captured him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he pronounced judgment on them. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes in Riblah. You get that scenario? He had to sit there while his sons were killed, and he was watching them die by, by demand. Yeah, right. And then, not only that, the king of Babylon uh, killed the sons of Zedekiah, and the king also, no, verse 7, moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with bronze fetters to carry him off to Babylon. And, it, and that's, that's bad enough. It, it, wars in those days were even worse than that. That's what, that's what people did as a matter of just, living, uh, of just living their life. A huge percentage. I've never seen any. Maybe some of you have seen any statistics. But a huge percentage of the human race were slaves. They were owned by other human beings. And could be bought and sold or could be um, raped or could be uh, beaten without any kind of, uh, of retribution. And um, I, I, I would imagine from what I have read, maybe some of you are historians, probably over half of the human race were slaves. I'm talking about the, around, around the world. We have plenty of slavery today. As a matter of fact, it's a, it's a big blemish. And Well, I'll come to that later. But uh, in, it was there. Human sacrifice? Human sacrifice was common because who were people worshiping? They were worshiping Satan and this whole army of, of, of demons because he had dominion and Satan wants blood. And, um, and you may have read about the Aztecs in Mexico where they had these ceremonies where for a period of time in these pyramids, the blood of virgins would flow down the pyramid so much that it was like a stream of water. I mean, it didn't stop. They, they were sacrificing so many virgins that that was their point for, uh, for Satan. And... Um, and, um, and, and, and all their uh, demons. Life expectancy was short. I mean, if you lived to be 30 years of age, you had lived a good life. It was very, very short. Women, women, in many cases, animals were treated better than women. Women were, w women were not treated by males as normal uh, human beings. You've read about travel was life-threatening. You had to take an army with you to travel from one place to the other, else you would get robbed and beaten and, and lose all your goods because there were professional thieves that were really good at it, and they could only be stopped by force. I mean, I, I, we could go down and down uh, that list. And everything that I mention here, and I could mention more, gives great pleasure to Satan. He loves that, everything I, everything I said. And the result of this is, that take how, think now together how the Bible describes Satan. The Bible says he is the God of this age. Now, I didn't make that up. It says he is the prince of the power of the air. Even Jesus called Satan, quote unquote, the ruler of this world. I know some people say, well, you know, you shouldn't talk that much about Satan. Well, those are people who never want to go to war. But I'll tell you that one of the first laws of warfare is to know your enemy. You're never going to win a war unless you understand your enemy. 
And so we need to know as much, have as much intelligence as we possibly can about Satan if we're going to join the army of God and if we're going to defeat Satan. If we're going to sit back and let somebody else do it, then, you know, don't worry about Satan because he's not a bit worried about you. But if you want to join the army of God, then, and take dominion, then it's very, very important. It's one other example is Jesus' third temptation, which you remember, that's the temptation where he was taken up on the mountain. Satan took him up on the mountain. And the Bible says that Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. He didn't show him 75% of the kingdoms of the world. It says he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, Jesus is standing there. Satan is able, supernaturally, to show him all the kingdoms of this world. And he said, Jesus, all you got, I'll give you these kingdoms if you just worship me. I'm not going to go into other details of the temptation. That's enough. Because Jesus never questioned Satan's right to offer him those kingdoms of the world. Why? Because he was the ruler. Jesus called him the ruler of this world. And Jesus, of course, made a, uh, didn't yield to Satan. But my main point is that Jesus recognized Satan's dominion that he got when He got, got it in the Garden of Eden. That's what he went in the Garden of Eden for, is to get that authority over, over the earth. So, God's plan for Adam had not yet materialized, but his purpose for creating Adam and the human race never changed. Which brings us to point number three. Point number three is the second Adam permanently reversed history. The second Adam pers- uh, permanently reversed history. Now think about this with me. And I, I'll, I'll bet you that I'm accurate on this, that world history has changed 180 degrees twice. Not once, not three times, world history has changed 180 degrees twice. It changed 180 degrees when Adam gave his dominion to Satan. Was that God's plan? No. But it changed the other 180 degrees when Jesus came to retake dominion and turn history back around to God's original plan. Now, it's not finished yet. That's one of the reasons I'm up here teaching this, because I'm, I'm leading up to a challenge, as you can well imagine. But uh, it's not finished yet. But we're clearly heading in the right direction. And we're on the winning side. Sometimes, you know, you might say, well, we've got to set back here and there. It doesn't matter. We're on the winning side. Okay. Now, think of this. Why did Jesus come? Why did he leave heaven and come to earth? Well, there's many reasons, but here's one that says right in the Bible. He says, for this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested. For this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil, which I've just been describing. Jesus came to destroy those works of the devil. That's in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, if you're, um, if you're jotting down. No, it's also... Uh, jot down Luke 19, verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse number 10. We, you know this verse. I'm going to play with it for a second here. Okay? It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, I don't know if you ever thought of this, but there's a difference between pastoral preaching and apostolic preaching. And, and uh, there's a difference between a pastoral interpretation of this verse and an apostolic interpretation of this verse. Because pastoral preaching, and I'm not saying we don't need pastoral preaching. We need plenty of it. But pastoral preaching stresses Jesus' death on the cross as paying the penalty for our sins so that we can go to heaven. And that's good preaching. I tell you what, if you, get any, if you ever got time, analyze Billy Graham's sermons. Every one of them says that. And um, so that's the pastoral interpretation of this. However, let me give you an apostolic view of the same verse because apostolic preaching takes the verse literally. Now, see, you're questioning in your mind, what do I mean? It takes the the, the verse 
literally. The uh, pastoral preaching reads Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who were lost. You know what the verse says? It says he, he has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What was lost? Dominion. The dominion was lost. That's why Jesus came. I'm telling you, turning history around. I'm not saying people don't need to get saved. Don't misquote me on that. Get that on God TV. Don't uh, say that I don't believe in preaching the gospel of salvation. I am saved by the blood of Jesus. You know? But I'm giving the, 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 the bigger picture of why Jesus came. Uh, some of you may know Apostle Joe Matera from New York. He has New York City. He has a, a book called Ruling in the Gates. And um, he's got a better book out now called Kingdom Revolution. I mean, it's, it's, they're both good, but Kingdom Revolution has uh, got more meat in it, including what he had in the other book. So, uh, so, but that first book, I took this quote from. Now, listen, when I read this quote from Joe Matera, you're going to hear a little different thing than you usually hear. Okay, he says, here's what Joe says, the main purpose of Jesus dying on the cross was not that so you can go to heaven. The main purpose of his death was so that his kingdom can be established in you. As a result, you can exercise kingdom authority on earth and reconcile the world back to him. Okay? That's a huge statement. And um, so, let's, you know, he says, reconcile the world back to him. Let's, let's just take a look for a moment at reconciliation. Let's, let's, how does, let me explain how God the Father sees this. Or like we say around here, how Daddy sees this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> it, was, it says in Colossians 1, and this is verse 19 and 20, for it pleased the Father that in him all fullness shall dwell, and by him, now him is capital H, that means Jesus, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth, get that, or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now, the a pastoral view of that would be all things means all people, all individuals. But the apostolic view of that would be, to, when it says to reconcile all things on earth, it would mean to re reconcile his creation. It means social transformation. It means dominion. It means changing the society in which we live. Now, that's God's, that's the Father's desire. It says so right there in the Bible. And how is this to be accomplished according to God's plan. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to say this now. I'm going to uh, even uh, underline it a little later. But uh, write down 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18. Okay, so it's God's plan to reconcile all things. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, isn't that interesting? Because Jesus paid the price for reconciliation, but God gave us the task of making it happen. I'm going to come, I want to come back to that. In fact, that's the way I, I, just, I just want to make sure that uh, we get that, that, that across. I like the way uh, Kong He of Singapore, I don't know if, uh, how, how many of you know um, Kong He, several of you do. He's got one of the hottest churches in, in well, I was going to say Asia, he's got one of the hottest churches in the world called City Harvest Church there, and I go there from time to time to minister. I, I mean, it's so, I, I, I'm just stalling because I'm just figuring out how much I should not say about City Harvest. I mean, I could spend a long time telling you about City Harvest, but the last time I was there, um, I had to preach four times well, the time before I was there, I mean, he, he makes me preach four times, see? And there's a small sanctuary. Then they also meet in the expo center. The small uh, worship center only seats 2,000, but the um, expo center seats 8,000. And so Saturday night, I have to go from one to the other, 
and then Sunday morning from the other to the one. And uh, they, they're about three quarters an hour on the other side of Singapore. So it's, it's quite a task. And he doesn't let you preach the same, doesn't let me preach the same sermon. Twice. Why? It's because when I leave, he wants a CD set that he can sell. See? I mean, he's an entrepreneur as well as a pastor. He's a... He, uh, uh, I'm going to talk... <laughs> I'm going to talk more about that church uh, this afternoon when I get in the, um, in, in, in the workshop. Anyway, come this afternoon. Hear more. But... Here's what he says. I'm, I'm quoting Kong He. I, I'm, I don't forget what the subject is. Subject is uh, reconciliation, right? And, and reconciling the world, the dominion of the world, back to God. Okay, here's what Kong He says. Unfortunately, many of us hold on to this mentality that since sin has already damaged the world, what's important now is to rescue as many people as we can from the wreckage. One preacher called this the lifeboat theology, looking at the world as if, it is, as if it is the ship Titanic. Then he says the correct Christian worldview is never the lifeboat theology, but the ark theology. Noah's ark not only saved people, it preserved all of God's creation. It brought everything back out to restore the earth. Every church must be like Noah's ark, drawing people in for discipleship, then sending them out to restore the world. I agree with that. And, um, uh, and, and this, is, this then brings me to the last point, which is number four. Okay. Jesus, and I told you I was coming back to this, Jesus delegated establishing his kingdom to us. I want to make that a whole point now. Jesus delegated establishing his kingdom to us. Think of Jesus... Uh, training his disciples. Now, he specifically, purposely trained his disciples to take charge when he left. Right? We all know that. He knew he was going to leave, and he trained his disciples to do that. And Jesus' last words on the earth were not the words on the cross like, like some people pretend they are, because he came back. He was back here for 40 days, right? And, but his last recorded words on the face of the earth uh, were Acts 1.8, which you know. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And it says, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Then pff, cloud took him up. He was gone. Now, that's, there must be something really significant about the very last words that he chose to say. And he said to his disciples, you will be my witnesses. Everybody say witnesses. witnesses. You know, you are a witness. You're supposed to be a witness of Jesus Christ. Now, what do witnesses do? Witnesses speak and act on behalf of Jesus. And there's a lot of things that that means. I mean, we got a, had a message yesterday from Bill Johnson in the I think it was yesterday, it seems like uh, in the afternoon. And um, uh, I mean, it wasn't in this, you didn't see it on God TV, but uh, we had an other meeting. And he gave a whole message on to act on behalf of Jesus means to do miracles. And you can prove that from the Bible. I mean, he did. And uh, that, that's, that sunk into my soul. I mean, that's, that's part of being what? A witness. If you're a witness of Jesus Christ, you act on his you do what he would do. Now, Jesus, when Jesus came, and you know this, he went around doing, so, and he was after his baptism and temptation, he went around and uh, healing the sick, doing miracles, and, um, but he, was, he, he, he didn't go directly, but he meandered around ministering, and then he ended up in Nazareth, which was his hometown, which he actually probably was aiming for, and uh, finally he got to Nazareth. Now, it, it's interesting that when Jesus got to Nazareth, he went into the synagogue and gave his first public speech. Think about that. Uh, any of you who are preachers, you know, you prepared a lot for your first public speech. And I imagine that Jesus prepared his first public speech really well. And actually what Jesus did was that he set out his agenda. I mean, he was beginning his ministry, sent out his agenda. 
Now, his agenda was not only for him, was it? It was also for his witnesses. Okay? And so it's a good thing to go back there in Luke 4 and read what Jesus said. Here's what he said in Luke 4, 18, in the synagogue of Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What was his first point? To preach the gospel to the poor. Do you think he thought that through? Or it was just an accident that that turned up there? I can't believe it was an accident. I believe that preaching the gospel to the poor is the first item in Jesus' agenda. Now, question, what is the gospel? The meaning of the word gospel is good news. Think this through with me now. To preach good news to the poor. Now, if you were poor, what's the best news you could possibly receive? You got it. You're not going to be poor anymore. You're going to prosper, right? That's what Jesus was saying. Give the good news to the poor. And I'm not going to go into this in detail in anything I'm going to teach here, but I, I teach a whole course on this. But if I, if, 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 I, if I did get into the detail about what it means when we talk about transformation of society, what are the, what are the signs? How do we know? How can we, how can we give sociological tests to find out if what we're preaching, what we're doing as witnesses to Jesus is actually working in our society? There are ways and means to do that. But those of us who are in that, and we, we have a common consensus now that we didn't have, well, probably less than 10 years ago, that the that the major, the major measurable sign that a people group or a nation or whatever is transformed, past tense, not being transformed, but past tense transformed, is the eradication of systemic poverty. Get that word systemic. I didn't say systematic. Systemic, which means poverty comes from what? It comes from the social system. Is that God's plan? Did the social system create poverty? No. Jesus put the first thing on his agenda to get rid of that, to preach good news to the poor, that there's no poverty. And transformation, one of the signs of transformation is the eradication of systemic poverty. And um, we got plenty of systemic poverty in the United States that we need to eradicate. In fact, there are only two nations in the world well, let me, just, uh, let me just pause, let me just give you another statement here. The opposite of systemic poverty would be systemic prosperity. Isn't that right? Which means that the social system produces what? Prosperity. Normally, people are prosperous in systemic prosperity. That is the will of God. If you don't believe it, read Deuteronomy 28. I mean, it's, you've got two part, well, I won't get on this. But um, the, Bible, the Bible is very clear on this, okay? So that's, that's what we're looking for. There are many steps getting to that, but eradication of systemic, or uh, the production of, the, uh, of uh, systemic prosperity. There are only two nations in the world that have systemic prosperity, Japan and Singapore. And uh, Japan is having some troubles right now, but I don't think it's gone off the list. But Singapore isn't. When you're born in Singapore, your destiny, just by being a Singaporean, is to prosper. In their equivalent of what we have as a pledge to the flag, they actually use the word prosperity. They speak out, all citizens of Singapore, it doesn't matter whether they're Christians or Muslims or what they are, speak out prosperity for their nation. And you know words make a difference. And they speak it day after day. And Singapore is has systemic prosperity. So, all I'm saying is it can be done. It's interesting that neither Japan nor Singapore was brought about by uh, overt Christian action. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't matter because the kingdom of God is really bigger than we think. And um, that is a value of the kingdom of God. All right. Now, every then Jesus went on to say other things. I got, I got stuck with that poverty thing. But Jesus went on to say other things like heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Every single word of that agenda upsets the devil. 
He doesn't like anything in that. Since the Garden of Eden, he had taken dominion, but Jesus brought a new kingdom, which is the kingdom of God. You don't read about the kingdom of God in the Old Testament. You only read about the kingdom of God after Jesus came, when Jesus came and after he, he came. So since that day, Jesus has been using his witnesses. Jesus isn't here. He's been using his witnesses to build his church, to advance his kingdom, and to reconcile more and more of creation to himself. He's been doing this for 2,000 years. And the devil it says in Revelation 12, 12, for the devil's come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. I don't know how short his time is. I mean, I wish, you know, a lot of, a lot of people have taken guesses. I don't know how short his time is, but I can tell you one thing for sure. It's shorter today than it was yesterday. <laughs> it's just mathematical. <laughs> He has, but he has great wrath because he's not going to be there forever. He has a short time. Satan has been gaining ground. Excuse me. Satan has been losing ground. I should say, I'm thinking of Jesus. Satan has been losing ground uh, for 2,000 years. And, um, but I believe the process is about to speed up really rapidly. So I'll say something prophetically. Now, you can write that down, because that's very unusual. No one has, <clears throat> no one has ever confused me with a prophet. But I can still prophesy, you know, by accident once in a while. And uh, I think <laughs> this is prophetic. Okay, so check it out. Satan will lose more ground in the next hundred years than he lost in the first 2,000. And that, don't, doesn't that make sense? I mean, it is speeding up. And, uh, oh, man, I envy those. I envy you younger people. You're going to see this. I mean, you who are in your 50s and 60s. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna see this. <laughs> I got my 80th birthday coming up in August. <laughs> But the year 2001 began the second apostolic age. I just want to give you a view of what some of the things that are happening. This is why it's speeding up. And um, the government of the church is now in place. I mean, there's a critical mass of the government of the church in, in place. And now the body of Christ is aligning with apostles and prophets. Until it aligned with apostles and prophets, we had to go slow in taking back dominion. Now that the government's in place, and why do, you, why do we need a government in the church? Because Satan has had a government. That's how he's made all, this prog all the progress he did. And it takes a government to overthrow a government. You can't overthrow a government without a government. Now the body of Christ is getting um, the government. So we're equipped. And this war has two major fronts. Now I can preach whole message on each one of them. So I'll refrain from that because it's getting to be lunchtime. But... Uh, I'll, I'll just mention the two fronts and then quit. Okay. Number one is a spiritual front. Now here's what the Bible says. It says we must stand against the wiles of the devil. That's, just, that, that's not being passive. That's an active verb. We must stand against the wiles of the devil of the devil. And what are his wiles? His wiles are whatever, whatever it takes to take back dominion, to get his authority back. Those are his wiles. And so this means spiritual warfare. You know, the, the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. And this, this, is, this, is, spirit, this is the spiritual front. Now, um, these two books that Darren showed you are um, books of mine that, that deal with this. Uh, First of all, this, this book, Praying with Power, we learned a lot about the, the decade in which the body of Christ learned more about prayer than any other decade in history, I dare say, uh, was the 90s. And, um, and, and just so we don't forget the 90s, this book is out called Praying with Power. And this has, this has one chapter on each of the aspects of prayer that we learned about, one being, one being spiritual warfare. 
but there are other aspects of prayer that we learned about tonight. We don't want to forget, so that's praying with power. But uh, this book um, has just been has just come out. Actually, it's two of my books in one called Warfare Prayer. This is a great book on spiritual warfare. And besides, there are uh, at the end there's uh, there there was what the Bible teaches about spiritual warfare. Twenty one questions that a lot of people ask about spiritual warfare and what the Bible says. So these are two. These are two resources that I'm glad have come out. They were, uh, they were first written in the, in, in the 90s, but I'm glad that they're out now for good so that um, you can use those for this spiritual front. Now, the second is the natural front. <clears throat> and this is the new cutting edge, edge for this generation. We, we must not forget the spiritual. It won't work without the spiritual. But the spiritual was the cutting edge. Now we're in it. Now the natural is the cutting edge for this generation. And we're, we're continuing to learn more and more about this because God is revealing powerful concepts. I mean, one concept that he has revealed that is just absolutely uh, changing, mind-changing, and action-changing is what's called the 7M mandate about the seven mountains of society. So if we're going to transform society, there are seven mountains we've got to transform, and that's what I'm going to teach on in the, over, in the overflow room this afternoon, the 7M, I'm going to call it the 7M template or the 7M mandate. And I won't go into that now because I'm going to teach it later. And then another concept that God is giving us for taking back dominion is the church in the workplace. The, 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 the church does not, there's not just people who meet on Sunday. The church is here seven days a week. And I'll talk about that tomorrow morning at this same time. So I want to make sure that we get that. And then if there's a church in the workplace, another thing that I'll, I'll, I'll stress tomorrow, if there's a church in the workplace, if the church is out there, there must be apostles in the workplace. This is one of the missing links we have, everybody, until we activate those apostles. Not put them there. God's already given them the gift to apostle in the workplace, but we must recognize, activate, and empower those people if we're going to uh, transform society. And then, we, then God is showing us another concept is the crucial role of wealth. The church has been under a spirit of poverty. I mean, the spirit of poverty has dominated the church ever since the Middle Ages. And we can trace back through the monastic movement. And um, uh, the church, I'm talking about the church in general, has been under a spirit of poverty. This is not the will of God. This is the will of the enemy. And the church needs to shift from that, to get under a, out from under a spirit of poverty, to get into a spirit of prosperity. I believe that Christians should be rich. And I'm not, you know, you can say, you preaching the prosperity gospel? Sure. I never even met Kenneth Hagin or Kenneth Copeland. I don't care. But, I'm, but, but the will of God is that we should be rich and that we should have abundance. Abundance to, to, to selfishly spend it on us? No. Abundance so that we can, we can further the kingdom of God. And it's going, to take, it's going to take wealth. I'll tell you one thing. I, I'll tell you one thing. We have all observed the rapid advance of Islam. You know, one of the things Islam has that we don't have? Money. I'm talking about, I'm not ta I'm, I'm talking about in the hands of the Islamic religion, there is huge amounts of money. They wouldn't be doing what they're doing now if they didn't have money. And we stand up in our pulpit and say money doesn't count. Yes, it does. It's, we're not going to transform society without it. Well, anyway, that's a... Next time I come, I'll talk on that one. <laughs> so this is an enormous assignment. Are you ready to come up and help me close this? Because uh, I want to ask you a question. You know, now you know the assignment. And my question to you, are we up to it? See, are we up to this assignment? Can we meet the challenge? Or are we just going to sit back and enjoy God and hope things turn out okay? We can, we can make the choice. Why? Because we're free moral agents. But what I want you to do is to think about the mountain that God has placed you in, the segment of society that you're in, and make your commitment to God that you will do whatever happens to transform the segment of society where God put you. Don't worry about where other people are. It's where you are. That's where it's going to begin, to transform that segment of society. So will we retake dominion? Say yes. Oh, I'll tell you what we better do. Stand up. Now let me ask that question again. Will we take dominion? Yes! 
Will we retake dominion? Yes. yes. I want you to, I want us to pray together. Follow me in this prayer. You know it, but follow me in this prayer. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. 